partner with Open Air to provide, like we talked about, um, kind of studio and workspace for local artists and artists and residents to do their work. Um, it's great to stop in if you have any kind of creative or even work project. And we love fostering community and art. So I think we're doing a good job. Thank you. My name is Kelly Sinner. I'm the coordinator and I'm pleased to introduce Hannah formally tonight. So Hannah is a born and raised Montana living, creating, and working in Missoula. She graduated from the University of Montana in 2019 with a BFA in painting and art education. Hannah's work currently centers around systems, arrangements, and relationships through the guise of technology and machinery. She enjoys using her artistic practice to play, tinker, and build meaningful relationships. Um, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Stoney. Thank you, Taylor. Um, I yeah. I'd first like to just give a shout out to all those lovely people who have made this possible. Um, I really, really was thrilled to to get this residency, and I was thinking about it all summer and looking forward to it. And when it finally happened, I was like, oh, I have to actually do this now. <laughs> Great. Um, but it's been such a breeze. It's been so wonderful. Um, and I really do think Taylor should get a ton of credit for, for being here and helping me troubleshoot and holding my hand throughout this stuff because um, all of this stuff in the makerspace was pretty new to me and to have somebody there to teach you how to do it is, um, is really wonderful. So thank you to Taylor, thank you to all of you at Open Air, I really appreciate it. And thank you to all of you for being here. I am so happy that you're here. Um, yeah, so as Kelly said, uh, my name's Hannah. I am a born and raised Montanan. I have been doing art for pretty much my whole life, but I just started to get back into it after the pandemic. I graduated in 2019, and I feel like after I graduated, I was kind of ready and geared up to go and start off in the world. Um, and then this like huge thing happened, uh, weirdly enough, and I <laughs> and it put a huge delay on everything. But I, um, I really was happy to have this residency because I felt like it was a place for me to kind of get started with art again and reacquaint myself with what it meant to make art and what it meant to kind of be creative in my free time because in the past my creativity was based on academics and school and how well I was performing. And it was really nice to be able to be in a space physically and in a headspace where I could just kind of experiment and play and have fun and remind myself that that's what art is all about. Um, but yeah, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about my work today, some of my past work, some of my current work. Um, so like Kelly said, a lot of my work centers on humans and our relationship with technology and how that can kind of um, impact our relationships with each other as well. As I'm sure we all know, like technology is a huge part of all of our lives now. Um, many of us couldn't imagine living without it at this point. Um, and I'd kind of like to take a step back and look at a few different perspectives that we've had on technology throughout the years. Um, so one of the really early ones is this era, <laughs> which I, was not around for, um, but I I really kind of look to this era as there's kind of a nice naivete here with technology. It's very much recognized as being like, you know, these machines are here for us. They do a job for us. We go into the office, we use the machines, and then we go home. Um, but I really, I don't know, I just really like the idea of technology being like filling this space when you're at work, you know, like you go to work and it's like everywhere. And when you go home, there's really none there because technology hasn't really become personal yet. This still feels very per impersonal to me. And then, of course, technology started becoming a little more personal. We started having more of it in our homes in like the 80s and 90s. So, you know, we have our first 
laptops, our first computers, our first gaming systems. Um, I remember using these in middle school because our middle school was not very um, financially sound, so we still had all the old computers, and we used to play all these different weird little math games on them that felt super outdated, even to me as a middle schooler. Um, but I still kind of love these, though. Like, they still do feel very much like, you know, they were designed to be tools for us to use, right? We still have kind of that power imbalance with technology there. And then we have this, like, <laughs> this is really cheesy to me, but this huge kind of boom in technology where it's very forward thinking. We're starting to really get into, like, well, what are the boundaries that we can push? What are the different barriers that we can break with this stuff? Um, and I feel like it's pretty hopeful, right? But it's also very impersonal. Like, I think there's an attempt to connect humanity with technology here, but it just feels like really cold and impersonal to me. And I feel like this is kind of something that happened in, I don't know, maybe like the mid 2000s where we started to see more of this kind of vibe when it came to humans and technology. And then with that came <laughs> this kind of uh, fear of technology or fear that it was turning us into zombies or that you know technology was out to get us and that we had gone too far with it. Um, and I think there is some merit in, in that caution and in that danger. Um, obviously, um, not that, but um, there is some like, there are some valid points in that technology can be dangerous, but I also think that I would like to choose a different kind of way of looking at it. So I saw this movie when it came out, um, and it kind of uh, changed my life a little bit. <laughs> I, I remember seeing it and thinking that it was the first time that I had seen the future and that I had seen humans and technology in a way and portrayed in a way that felt really hopeful and really warm, as opposed to, you know, totally having humans and tech be these two separate entities. This movie really felt like it was able to bring those two together, and it was able to make it, I don't know, more of this, this little personal relationship. And it became more about the qualities that humans brought to technology instead of the qualities that technology brought to us. Um, and I don't know, that, that just kind of really kick-started me into thinking about, you know, why, why are these devices important in our lives? Why do we, why do we keep these things around? Um, and what, what do they say about us? And so I think that, you know, some of the previous views, like, I feel like this kind of is looking at technology through a lens of human, like, insecurity <laughs> in a way, like, this technology is more powerful than us. It's going to take over us. But this feels like it's taking a look at human insecurity and technology in a different way. It's almost like technology is reflecting our insecurities, but in a way that um, kind of makes them a little more, like makes people a little more empathetic toward it, or you know. So. Some of the artwork that I've been kind of thinking about during this time, um, Nick Ramage is one of my favorite artists right now. I just think everything he makes is so fun. And it kind of, looking at his work kind of gave me the, it made me feel comfortable to make work that was just fun and funny for the sake of being fun and funny. Um, and so here's a video of one of his pieces. And the sound isn't really that important, but see if it'll play it. that and we're like, oh, you go, little guy, like you got it. Um, 
And so, I don't know, I just was really thinking about his work. And then another artist that I really like, um, Rachel Yoon, she does these kind of weird fusions with machines and plants. And this is a show that she had a while ago. It's just a video of that show. But, um, I'll turn the sound off just because it's kind of loud. But it's like she hooked up all these plants to these different machines and they're all just like having this weird little party. <laughs> And it feels like almost you're like invading something by watching this. You're like, oh, okay, they're having their own little event in here. Um, but I just really like the way that she, I don't know, used those materials and gave them sort of an agency that they wouldn't have otherwise had. And then I, I was also thinking about some of the stuff that I grew up with and the ways that technology was introduced to me as a kid. Um, and I remember like being a girl, I remember having all these, you know, these toys kind of targeted towards towards me and towards my friends. Um, and I look back on them and I kind of think they're like a little bit awesome. Um, not because they're like targeted toward any specific gender. I don't think that part's awesome, but I think that like the design of them is kind of fun. Like to think about, you know, what if actually real cell phones were designed like this? You know, like what what differentiates this toy from a real cell phone or this computer from a real laptop? Um, and just kind of the aesthetic qualities of these, I just really like. I think there's something so sweet about trying to design something that's based on like a real life adult thing. And I don't know, I feel like there's just so many fun like images here, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, and then one of my newer favorite artists, um, Genesis Bellinger, she is a ceramicist and sculptor, and her works are really kind of surreal and odd, but she, like I said with um, Rachel Yoon's work, like, she gives these objects so much agency, and it, it just really feels like she takes care of these objects when she's making them and really cares about portraying them in a, in a way that, that feels right to her. Um, and that's kind of what I want to do. I want to, you know, find these objects that I really kind of latch onto and give them a little bit of agency, give them a little bit of um, space to be what they are and to be observed a little bit. So I started doing this work um, when I was a BFA student and I always thought of myself, I was like, I'm, I'm an illustrator, that's all I do. I just draw and paint and that's it. Um, and so I was doing these big kind of like series of kind of these like horror vacuity paintings, just like trying to fill as much space as I could with all these different little techno technological elements. Um, and I made a bunch of these and I kind of got sick of making them because um, it felt to me, they were supposed to be fun and exciting, but at the end of making them, I felt like I was on like a roller coaster and had eaten a bunch of cotton candy and then like wanted to get off. So I, you know, I, I made all these and, and I had a lot of fun making them, but then I wanted to focus more on um, individual objects because I felt like this was almost, I don't know, this, this time kind of passed and I needed to focus on, on something a little bit simpler. So I started making these smaller kind of individual machines, these little babies, and that way I kind of got a chance to hone in on the certain qualities of each one as an individual and think a little bit more about composition. Um, and then I got really bored with drawing and <laughs> I started doing sculpture despite never having any experience or desire to do sculpture. Um, I kind of felt like it was a natural next step. So I started going to Goodwill and taking apart a bunch of old answering machines and clocks and radios and things that I knew that were just gonna be thrown away anyway. Um, and I especially took interest in the different circuit boards of these machines. So I would take them apart, I'd spray paint them white, and then it would be like a coloring book. And I could literally just fill in however I wanted. Um, and I felt like I just wanted to bring attention to all these little individual elements that made up each of these things that we, that are like hidden from us, you know, like in that camera. I mean, there's tons of tiny little bits and bobs that we don't even really understand that are hidden and we don't see them. 
Um, and so I wanted to kind of bring attention to more of those little qualities and kind of bring, I don't know, more of a human nature to some of these, make them kind of fun and bubbly and give them personality that they wouldn't have really had before. Um, this is a, like a circuit board or something from a tape deck, so those are the little buttons that you would press on the top. Um, and I just, I don't know, I just had so much fun like discovering these as I was painting them, you know, like I, I kept finding new little pieces as I would turn different angles, I'd find different pieces and I could see how different mechanisms worked. Um, and it kind of bettered my understanding of how some of these objects function as well. That's another circuit board. That one kind of looks like an aerial view, I feel like, of like a city or a landscape. And then there are all these little baby circuit boards. Um, these are from mice, computer mice. Um, and what I thought was really interesting is that they still retain the qualities of computer mice even without the shell. Like I feel like if you looked at these long enough and had to guess what they were, you would probably be able to guess that they were mice. I think it's just really interesting that they still retain that quality. Um, then there's one of the shells of the mouse, mice, mouses, that I used. Um, and so just kind of combining different materials that I found, kind of recontextualizing these objects a little bit. And then I got really interested in this motif of the outlet and the plug, or the socket and the plug. Um, and it was something I had kind of overlooked before because I felt like it was too simple of a concept to focus on. And, but I kept, I kept coming back to it. Every time I would make something, I would think about, you know, how would I, how would I depict a plug or a socket in this medium? Or how would I depict, you know, this idea? And I feel like there are so many insinuations that we make around these two images as well um, that are really fascinating to me and really exciting. And because of the simplicity of the, you know, the form of the socket and the form of the plug, it felt very versatile. It felt like I could do a lot with it. So I started kind of exploring that more and more. Um, I went to Home Resource and bought a ton of these switch plates and started using the switch plates to kind of make poetry in a way. Um, I have over a hundred of them now and they all say something different. Um, but when they're all lined up, it's kind of fun to rearrange them and it's almost like making a poem or, you know, those fridge magnets where you can make sentences. Um, that's what it kind of feels like to me. So, I don't know. Those are fun. And then I started just thinking, you know, what else, what other mediums could I use to <laughs> to get this idea across. Um, so those are little embroidery hoops. And then I started making these like bigger kind of plug sculptures. So this one is um, wood and then obviously I have the rope cord. But these, this one specifically, I was making a series that were all, you know, I, I knew I wanted to do wood and I knew I wanted to do these larger like flat pieces. Um, and so I rented a scroll saw from MUD and was working on it and it was literally the worst. I hated it so much. Um, it was so hard and I'm someone who really, I, I feel like I care about precision like a decent amount. Um, and it was really hard for me to be precise. It was really difficult for me to get it how I wanted it to look. Um, and so I was trying to do those. I kept experimenting with those. Um, and then I did some prints as well with this switch plate idea. Um, but then I started the residency here and Taylor showed me the laser cutter. <laughs> and it literally blew my mind. I was like, you know, I put in the wood and I, I was like, why well, can I just pull up an image of like an outlet on Google Images and, and put it in there? And Taylor was like, yeah, yeah. And um, 
And then, you know, the, on the program that you use for the laser cutter, it'll tell you how long each cut is going to take. So it'll tell you, you know, oh, this, this engraving, engraving this image will take an hour. And so I, you know, we pulled it up and it was like 30 seconds. And I was like, wow, that's insane. Um, and then there's a little window at the top of the engraver where you can just watch it work. And it was like magic to me. Like <laughs> watching it cut through the wood and have it be precisely and exactly what I wanted. I like, I left the library that day like so happy. I was so excited. Um, but yeah, it was really fun and it, it's been like a game changer as far as um, tools go for me. I, it's allowed me to have um, the precision that I wanted and be able to make more because it takes so little time to, to actually cut the wood. Um, and then I've also been experimenting with the 3D printer a little bit. Um, that was probably the most intimidating thing for me in the makerspace, um, just because I feel like it can do so much and there's so much room for error. And um, I, I see these little kids come in and like print these like amazing things and be like, okay, well, if a little kid can do it, hopefully I can do it. <laughs> um, but it's been really fun to mess with that as well. And I have, I have a, a little electrical plug that I printed. Oh, I shouldn't do that. Um, I have a little electrical plug that I printed because I had used the 3D scanner to scan a plug. And I kind of described it to Stoney and Kelly as like a game of telephone. So a lot of this technology isn't flawless yet. It's still pretty new and there are all these bumps and little things. So. I had scanned this plug on the 3D scanner and then you take it into the program and you have to kind of edit it and edit out the parts that you don't want and the, you know, the program of the scanner has a function for it to kind of smooth the surface or it kind of guesses what to fill in the gaps that it didn't quite get. Um, and so the 3D scan of it, there were, you know, a few little errors with it, but I moved forward and 3D printed it and it was... <laughs> It had some weird little funky textures on it and weird little shapes, and it was not perfect like I you know, was kind of hoping or thinking it would be. Um, but I actually kind of liked that more because it reflected the process of going through that. And it reflected you know, the, the fact that I was in a, like collaborating with this technology, you know, and that um, it's not always going to be perfect. There are going to be a lot of flaws. Um, but it was kind of like, Learning all, how to use all these machines was a little bit like when you start a new job and you have to like get used to all your new coworkers, and like some of them are like a little weird, <laughs> and some and they all like have weird quirks that you have to get used to. Um, some of them you like more than others. Some of them you like, you know, can kind of bond with a little more than others. Um, and so that's how I kind of felt starting here. It was a little bit like getting introduced to all these new. Um, people or <laughs> like organisms that I had to now interact with and, and negotiate with. So it was really fun. It kind of reinforced my my love for technology and my love for um, humanizing technology because I it really did kind of reinforce that idea of of you know technology is made by us. Like it reflects us more than anything else. Um, and I felt like. That was, that was really exciting to me to have that reinforced. Um, but yeah, I, have, I don't really have much else unless anybody has any questions or things they want to talk about. Oh, God. yeah. How long did it take you to design the thing that was cut out in 30 seconds? Um, so for me, it took it did not take that long because the, the program that the laser cutter uses, or the one here uses, um, it lets you pull like a PNG from Google Images and then it can trace it. So it can trace the lines in it. So if you're just cutting out lines, um, it's actually pretty easy to, to put that image in the program, trace the lines, and then have it cut. Um, but I know a lot of people use that that tool for engraving and for doing much more um,
complex images, and that typically takes maybe a little over an hour or even more than that sometimes. Um, but for what I was doing, which was pretty simple, it was very quick. Anybody else? Yeah. Could you address the, uh, some of the work that was here? I yeah. The uh, connections are very, very interesting. Totally. Yeah, so um, this is pretty much all the work I've kind of been working on here so far. Um, so I've just been playing a lot with this, you know, this form of the outlet of the, the plug. Um, and this was one that I wanted to make. I knew I wanted to make a power strip for sure. And all of these are going to be wall pieces, ideally. Um, they do have sawtooth painters on them. But um, I really wanted to kind of play with these different forms that these simple like motifs could take um, and different arrangements. And I made, you know, kind of some different connections with these. Um, but a lot of a lot of this work is made in kind of a headspace that I got into because I started um, using Tinder. <laughs> um, and it really was interesting to me. Tinder is so fascinating to me. Um, Can you define Tinder for those of us who? Yeah, so <laughs> Tinder is a dating app. Um, and it's been around for quite a few years now, I think. But um, some people use it just for fun. Some people use it like looking for serious relationships. Um, but it's really fascinating because basically it just shows you all the people in your area who also have Tinder and who are like, you know, on the market. Um, and so I started going on more dates than I've ever gone on in my life. And it is the weirdest experience ever. Like, I, so I did this thing where I decided to go on like four dates in one week with different people. And just kind of to see, like, because I think people's personalities are so interesting. And especially in that kind of environment, I don't know. I just think it's really fascinating. Um, so I started thinking a little bit more about compatibility and what makes people compatible and what makes us attracted to somebody and how many ways that can go wrong or how many ways that can change. Um, and so I started kind of thinking of these images as like a, a reflection of, of compatibility because they're obviously, you know, these two things that are made to go together. Um, but what happens when you take that away? What happens when you change that and alter that and um, add different quirks and awkwardness and strangeness to it? Um, and so that's kind of where a lot of these pieces are coming from. Um, yeah, it's a little bit weird, but. Anybody else? Yeah. Do you feel like these objects have a strong legal affinity with like baby toys? I'm curious if you could talk to that. Totally. Yeah. I on the studio visit that I had with Kelly and Stoney um, last week, I believe. Um, we were kind of talking about this, and I did want to have kind of that childlike quality to them because I was inspired by, like I showed, like the different. Um, Toys and the different ways that we kind of like baby down technology. Um, and I kind of felt like that was perfect for me as someone who frankly isn't that knowledgeable about technology, kind of treating it as like a toy or something kind of fun and goofy made it seem a lot more approachable to me as a subject. And so that's kind of where that's coming from, more or less. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, when I look at the um, plugs, you know, it's always a face that yeah. I see in there. Um, so did you play with that at all? It looks like on the one you have like a mouth. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. I feel like um, I feel like that just kind of happens naturally. Like I feel like we just tend to see faces in things, yeah. um, and that kind of speaks to our desire to humanize technology in a lot of ways. Like. I think there are lots of different, um, you know, things in life that we just tend to see faces in. 
Um, but yeah, I definitely wanted to play with the idea of it looking like a face. I think they kind of look like a little bit like masks to me in a way as well. Um, so thinking about that imagery is kind of fun, and I want to do more with that, but I'm not quite sure how to yet. Did you have one too? I was just wondering about your choice of colors. Um, it appears that you're in a pastel kind of. Totally, yeah. I am very committed to the pastel thing. <laughs> um, I just feel like for me, um, that color palette just is completely non-threatening and that's how I want my work to be. Um, and I also think having a cohesive color palette really um, has always helped me create more. So like knowing that I have some, some boundaries to create within has kind of helped me produce a little bit more work that fits into that genre or kind of fits into that aesthetic, I guess. Um, and yeah, I've just been very committed to these colors. I've been thinking about the things that we kind of associate them with, like Ian said, like baby toys or kids toys. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just, uh, I'm just really in love with them. And <laughs> I, I really don't know how else to justify it. I think that they're just fun and they're, um, they lend themselves to the tone of the work really well. So, yeah. 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 It's really fun to interpret things, you know. Well, first of all, the plug doesn't go with the subtle. They don't match. You know, you've got a two plug and a, a three. Yep. <laughs> but the colors make them so delicious. I mean, they just, you look at them and you think of petty pores or something that you could just eat it up. But I see the, some connections are purple. You've got the fur flags. You've got the chain. You've got the warm fuzzies. You, you know, so all of those are very uh, illustrative of the uh, attempts at connections. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I love that comment. Yeah, I think. I think the my goal is to make them to make them all like fit together aesthetically, but then the closer you look at them, the more you realize like actually these two don't make sense together. Like maybe this one makes more sense than this one. Um, and so yeah, kind of trying to pair them is really interesting. Um, and I don't know if I I guess I can say this. There's no kids in here. Um, the other day when Stoney came over and she saw all these like laying on the table. She was like, this kind of looks like an orgy. <laughs> <laughs> and I keep thinking about that because I think it's so funny. Um, because I wanted them to have this, this really innocent quality, but also, you know, the forms in themselves lend themselves lend themselves to, you know, different different things that we think about and different innuendos. So I kind of like that that dichotomy between these being really soft and fun and fluffy, but also they're like a little bit sexual, like they're a little bit um, perverse in a way, um, which, yeah, I think is kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. really just want to get into more of the 3D printing, 
I did use the Cricut the other day for the first time. I stayed here last night for like um, nine hours and um, <laughs> cut out shapes on the Cricut. Um, but I, I just really feel like I, I want to get more out of those those machines now that I know how to use the basics of them, um, and to kind of to kind of push them a little bit and see see what they can do, um, and kind of play with uh, error as well because I think error is a really important thing that comes up a lot when you're using technology. So kind of uh, finding ways to embrace the errors and turn the errors into pieces of their own hmm. is kind of what I want to work on. But, yeah. uh, I also really appreciated seeing your progression and uh, seeing the pieces that you painted on uh, from Goodwill or whatever the circuit boards kind of made me think about when people take paintings from uh, thrift shops, whatever, and like a sea painting and then they'll paint it a monster or something on their own. Yeah. And so it's interesting to see you go from the illustration, which is there's a lot of kind of creativity in the mashups of technology. And I saw one of the images, like the mouse who glued a light bulb onto or something. And it would be neat to see more sculptures from you that do more of that uh, mashup of the found technolo technology. It's neat to see you explore that kind of space. Too. Yeah, well thank you. Yeah, I, I would like to get back into doing those. Um, I got so obsessed with this like outlet and plug thing that I just like really went for it. Um, but I do want to get back to those because I think they are really interesting and I, I want to be able to learn a little bit more so I can do um, more kinetic work because I feel like this subject matter kind of lends itself to kinetic work a little bit, you know? So I that's something I really want to move towards as well. Yeah. So so piggybacking off of that, you you showed the the image of uh, her. Uh, can you describe for people who are not familiar with that movie kind of some of the basic premise and then my follow-up kind of question is, is that still on your mind? And do you imagine like AI or kind of that role of like compassionate technology continues to find its way into like your the work that you might make in the future? Totally. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you haven't seen the movie Her, you should definitely see it. Um, it is a movie set in kind of the near future about this man who um, gets like a, you know, an operating system, like a smartphone sort of, um, like Siri, where it talks to you and things, and he um, falls in love with her. Um, and it's kind of about the, their relationship and the ways that he has to, like, come to terms with the fact that he's in love with this piece of machinery and that the piece of machinery is reciprocating those feelings. Um, and it's just a really fascinating, kind of sweet, sad movie. Um, and as far as thinking about AI and stuff, I, um, I'm kind of torn because I really, I really want to love the idea of AI. Um, but I think that, I kind of think that there should be um, limits to it. Like I think that we should let machines be machines and people be people. Um, even though the intersection between that is really interesting. I feel like there should be a little bit of separation there, but I, I'd i really like to explore the idea that, you know, I don't know, I like AI can make art now. Have you all seen that? Like the different, um, you know, you put in prompts and then the AI will generate like a painting or um, there's that weird website where you can literally put in anything and the AI will generate it. Like you could put like the Pope if he were a frog at a bowling alley. And the AI will like generate that in like seconds. Um, and so I feel like the idea of that is really interesting to me too. Like how, how is this changing art? How do we define art? You know, is that, are we allowed to call that art? Because it's synthesizing images that we made and that we put into the world. So 
is it technically you know made by us in a way because it's made by us as a collective and then this is just something that's pulling from all of us I don't know but yeah it's an interesting thing to think about for sure have you ever heard of a human collaboration with AI as being called centaurs yes I have and that is super freaky to me <laughs> do you know why like do you know how that term came to be because I don't started with Gary Kasparov when Deep Blue beat the first team to me, and then they started to have like super chess leagues <laughs> where it would be human AI teams. The AI could never beat the centaur teams on its own. The, really? the human plus the AI always had a level of insight above the standalone. That's what I'm talking about. That's awesome. I love that. I let y'all go to eat cookies and drink sparkling water. <laughs> Thank um, before any of you go, I would love to invite you to take a pair of these. My only stipulation is that you have to take a pair. You have to take a plug and a socket. But you can take them and do with them what you will. Um, those are my party favors. Um, but yeah, unless anyone has any other questions, I'd just like to thank you all for being here, for listening to me ramble. Um, this is my first time I've ever really talked about my work in front of people in this capacity, so I'm a little nervous, but you all made it so lovely. So thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you.